Welcome to this video. Today we are talking about Einstein's notation in machine learning and deep learning and how it can help us. In machine learning and deep learning, we are, we are very interested in objective functions, since we use them to assess the loss and we compute the gradients out of these objective functions in order to train our models. So a very commonly used objective function, especially in regression problems, is the mean squared error function. That is defined here, over here, where y hat is the model prediction. y hat is in this case x times w, which is used in polynomial regression problems. So what is the derivative of the objective function with respect to the weight vector? Well, before we actually answer this question, we have to talk a little bit about linear algebra. We often deal with vectors. For example, we have here two vectors, x and y. x is equal to 1, 0, 1, and y is equal to 1, 0, minus 1. So you see they are three-dimensional. A vector represented in such a way is always associated with a basis. A very common basis is the Euclidean orthonormal basis defined over here by various three eigenvectors. You can naturally extend it to arbitrary dimensions orthonormal means that those eigenvectors are normalized and orthogonal to each other. Anyway, when we compute the scalar product, we denote it as x times y. But when we identify x as a column vector, we attach the t symbol to x, that means it is transposed. The scalar product is the sum over the individual components of each vector. When we use Einstein's notation, we can actually leave that sum symbol out in order to simplify our notation. Whenever a summation over a vector component goes over all the indices, meaning over all the components of the vectors, we can leave the sum symbol out. Then we can simply write our scalar product as xi times yi. Actually, that is not very precise. Einstein's notation is normally more expressive in the sense that one has lower and upper indices, an upper index denoting contravariant vectors, meaning column vectors, and a lower index denoting a covector, so a row vector, to say it a little bit more sloppy. But whenever we are working in Euclidean space, we refrain from this more expressive notation and use the simplified one with only lower indices. Now some rules before we start with the cool computations. Suppose we got this expression ai is equal to aij bj, where aij is an element out of a matrix. To be precise, it's the i-th row and j-th column element of the matrix, and bj is the j-th component of the b-vector. This is a simple matrix product with a column vector that results in another column vector a. But in Einstein notation, we are always looking at the components of the vector. So that is why we denote A as AI, because we are looking at the i-th component of the vector i. The first rule is that whenever an index appears only once, like i does here, it is called a free index, which implies that the left-hand side of an equation needs an equal amount of free indices as the right-hand side of the equation. The second rule is whenever an index appears twice, like j does here, it is called a dummy index, which implies that we sum over it. The third rule is whenever an index appears thrice, like i does in, the wrong, in this wrong example, it is called a mistake. There's still one additional thing that we have to clarify before we dive into some calculations. When you got a real valued function f that has as an input a d-dimensional vector, is the derivative of f than a column vector or a row vector? Well, we can help ourselves by having a look at the Taylor expansion around x plus h. We get f from x plus the first derivative of f times h plus higher order terms that we ignore for now, because they are not important for our argument here. Now, f is a scalar value. We denote that as r1 times 1. So the right-hand side has to be also a scalar. f from x is a scalar. h is a column vector, as well as x. So the first derivative 
has to be a row vector in order to give us a scalar on the second term on the right hand side of the equation. So the first derivative is indeed a row vector. One has to say that this is part of a convention. Once you have chosen a certain convention, you should stick with it for the rest of your calculations and computations. Now, without any further talking, let's dive into the calculations of a derivative of our beloved mean squared error objective function. Let's rewrite it in Einstein's notation. It is then one half bi bi, where bi is actually yi minus x times w. And since x is a matrix, we denote it with lower indices i and k, and the weight vector got also an index k because we are doing a matrix vector multiplication here, so we have to sum. So we need a dummy index, in this case it's k. By the way, you can choose whatever index you like. It doesn't have to be i or k, you can also name it j or f. It's just important that you stay consistent with your naming. So what is the first derivative? Well, if we take the first derivative of the objective function with respect to the weight component j, it's equal to one half. And now we have to apply the product rule. That gives us a two times bi and the first derivative uh, with respect to the jth component of the weight vector on bi. What is this first derivative on bi? Well, it is actually so we substitute back again, from B, for bi we substitute j, ji minus xik wk. And this is equal to minus xik, right? Because with the derivative of gi with respect to wj is zero, right? Because gi doesn't depend on our weight vector. So we only have to compute the derivative of a second term, which gives us minus xik and the derivative of wk with respect to wj. And this will give us minus xik and the derivative will give us a Kronecker delta with kj indices. Why does it give us a Kronecker delta? Well, because when we take the derivative of wk with respect to wj and Imagine k and j would be different indices, then the result would be actually zero, right? And if the indices are equal, so if k is equal to j, then the result would be one. Yeah? Imagine it like when you take the derivative of x with respect to x, it will give us one. But if you take the derivative of x with respect to j, it will give us zero, right? That is how you can imagine the Kronecker delta to work here. And this will give us my, minus xij. So we substitute the k with a j. Why do we do that? Because k is the dummy index here. So we have to do a summation over the matrix with a Kronecker delta. And we know already, okay, Kronecker delta gives us only a contribution of one if k is equal to j. That is why we substitute k equal to j, because it's the only contribution that is non-zero. So, it's, so that is why we get minus xij. Okay, now we can use this side computation for our main result. So we know, okay, the derivative of the objective function with respect to omega j is equal to minus bi xij. And I have colored the indices here for you to understand how the index structure is. So j only appears once on the left-hand side of the equation and only once on the right-hand side of the equation. So that is our free index. And i appears twice on the right-hand side, right? For bi and xij. And that is a dummy index. So we have to sum over i. And also notice that we have no index that appears thrice. So we didn't make a mistake, at least regarding the indices. And that is equal to minus, and then yi minus xik wk, because we substitute back in again for b, times xij. And when we want to convert that result to the generalized result of the objective function, the, the derivative with respect to the weight vector, this would be equal to minus, and then 
j minus x times w transposed of that times x. Why transpose? Because remember, the derivative of a scalar valued function with respect to a vector that we identify as a column vector has to be a row vector. So, so we have a row vector on the left hand side. So we need also a row vector on the right hand side. And y minus xw and the transpose of that is such a row vector times x. So a row vector times a matrix will give us a row vector. So we have on the right hand side a row vector as well as on the left hand side. Now if we want to take the second derivative of our objective function with respect to the weight vector, we can write it in Einstein notation again as the derivative of the objective function with respect to the partial derivative of omega j. And this time we do a second derivative so we have to choose another index omega m. By the way, a tip, always choose a different index on the, on the left hand side when you take the derivative than you have already on the right hand side because then you would have often become free ind indices and this would be a mistake, right? And this is equal to minus, so the first derivative we already computed so we can just plug it in and now we only have to take the derivative after wm. And this is equal to xik and now we have to take the derivative of omega k with respect to omega m. Again, yi doesn't depend on omega, so we can cancel it and then times xij. And this is equal to xik, and all we know this is already our Kronecker delta, right? Delta km, xij, and we know already that we only have to substitute for km. So our result will be xim times xij. The summation of i, m and j are, are our free indices. And since we have two free indices on the left hand side as well as on the right hand side, we know the result has to be a matrix. And this is also the case. And what we also see is that i is not adjacent to each other. So we know that the first matrix has to be the transposed. So the result is the second derivative of the mean squared error objective function with respect to the weight vector is x transposed times x. Now let's do another example in order to get a little bit practice with the Einstein notation. Einstein notation is a, the idea behind is actually quite easy, but to become aware of all the conventions that one uses and also how to apply it, it is worth to practice it a lot. So our function this time is one half x transpose times x, where x is a d-dimensional column vector. So the first derivative after x is one half, and here is a mistake because we just here we just have rewritten f in Einstein notation, right? It's not the first derivative. So and then the first derivative of f with respect to xk, so we write it, so we take the derivative after the kth component of x, right? is equal to one half, and now the first derivative are for xi, xi. Now we have to apply the product rule again. So we have one half first derivative of xi with respect to xk times xi plus one half xi and the first derivative again. This is equal to one half, and now you know, you, you guessed it already, it gives us the Kronecker delta, delta ik, xi plus one half xi, Kronecker delta ik. And this is equal to one half x k, right? Because we substitute i with k plus one half x k. And what you can see here is that the index i appeared completely, disappeared completely. This has to be the case because on the left hand side we have only one free index k, right? So on the right hand side, each term also should have only this free index k. And this is the case. And now one half xk plus one half xk is equal to xk. Now, again, if when we want to generalize our result, so the first derivative of f with respect to the column vector x is equal to x transposed. Why transposed? Well, the same game as before, because 
The first derivative is a row vector. So we have on the left hand side a row vector. So we need a row vector on the right hand side. This is it. Now it is your time to shine. If you want to check whether you have understood Einstein's notation, try to solve the following problem. You got this function that is equal to one half x transposed a times x, where x is a d-dimensional column vector and a is a square matrix, which is of dimension d times d. What is the derivative of f with respect to x? Try to solve it with Einstein's notation and without and find out for yourself which is easier one to use or more intuitive to understand. In the near future, I will publish a video where I will show you the solution to this problem. So stay tuned. If you like this video, subscribe and like, and I see you in the next one. Have fun.